We've come to a place in Scripture where we're going to hear some of these mysteries that the Bible holds. We're going to we're going to really start to interpret some of the mysteries that the Bible holds. Mike said before that um, uh, we speak Christianese, and a lot of times when we speak Christianese and we evangelize in Christianese, people don't get what we're saying. I mean, what are these words that people are using? What's the word righteousness? How does it pertain to my life? What's the word holiness? Holiness, what a word. What, how does that pertain to my life? Even the word evil. You, you look up the word evil. The word evil is the word spoiling. You know, we use these words, we throw these words out, but we don't always put them out in the proper way for people to understand what we even mean. And so we come to this place in Scripture where Jesus is giving a sermon. And he's giving a sermon in parables. And the interesting thing about parables is that they're hidden, they're words that don't make sense. He teaches in words that don't make sense so that people that want to hear will dig in a little bit to the meaning and try and figure it out. It's kind of neat. And he gave three major sermons. He gave the Sermon on the Mount. He gave the Olivet Discourse, the Sermon on the Mount of Olives. And he gave this sermon. And this sermon I titled Sermon on the Beach. Anytime I can get beach into something, uh, we're going to do it. So this sermon was the Sermon on the Beach. And the first, ser the first teaching he, he does, so the first parable he gives, is this parable of the, of the uh, four seeds. Remember the parable of the four seeds? He says that the farmer comes along or the sower comes along and throws out some seed and some seed falls on so certain soils. Well, the point of the parable, Jesus gives us the meaning behind it. The point of it is the soils. The point of it is the soils pertain to or are a picture or a symbol of the heart of a person. And he says there are four soils. He says the first soil, he says uh, the first soil is the ego. The next soil is humanism or people's faith in men. People's faith in me, people's faith in men, and finally the third soil is people's faith in objects, in things, in stuff, in the wrong stuff. The fourth soil that this farmer throws the seed into, and by the seed, by the way, the seed is the word of God, the fourth soil is the realistic heart, the heart that takes the word of God into his life and then applies it to his or her life. So we have four soils. So that's the first parable that Jesus gives, and he explains it. The second parable that comes along that he, that he gives is he talks about this farmer who throws out seed, and the seed starts to grow. And all of a sudden, the evil one, the one who spoils, comes along, and who is the devil, by the way, and he comes along, he throws more seed out, but this seed is weeds in the midst of the 
wheat in the midst of the good seed that the farmer is sowing. So what happens to that? Well, the people, the wheat, come to the Lord and say, or the people of God come to the Lord and say, listen, there's garbage in our midst. What's going on? There's weeds in our midst. There's stuff that's not supposed to be in our midst. Should we pull it out and throw it away? And the Lord says, no, because you can't really tell the wheat from the weeds as it's in the process of growing. You can only tell the wheat from the weeds after it grows by the fruit of whether it's wheat or weeds. In other words, can we use it? Can God use it? Or can't God use it? And so we have these two parables that Jesus explained. He actually explained both these parables to us. He explained the mysteries of the symbols behind these parables. And so both really are about the heart. Both are about the four soils and the different types of hearts. And the second one is about what is your heart? Are you weed or weeds? You could say you're a Christian. You could be in a Christian church. You could be walking and talking Christianese all day long. But are you really wheat or weeds? Now, how do you know that? Well, here's how you know that. You've changed. That's the only way you know. See, in the process, you don't even know. In the process, you can't even pull yourself up and throw yourself away. Because only God knows if you're saved. You don't even know. But you have evidence of the fact that you're saved by the fact that you've changed. How have you changed? You've surrendered your life to God. You've given your ways to God. You are willing to walk in sacrificing your life for God. Now, how do you do that? God's spirit. How do you do that for God? There's really no way to do that directly for God, but indirectly you do that for each other. That's why faith without works is dead, James says. See, it's the belief that you have put into action, which is for God, but really the, the direct recipient is each other. That's how you know you're weak. If you aren't moving, if you aren't walking, if you aren't working towards that. You know, there are times when you just sit and listen, but there are other times when you need to move. And when God puts it on your heart. Yesterday I was watching um, a, a show on World Vision, you know, the, the, uh, where, they, where you support a little kid. You know, you, pay, you buy basically uh, every month. You send money in and you buy sort of things for the kid. You kind of adopt a kid from this particular place was Africa. And I'm thinking, well, I used to do that when I was first a Christian because God put it on my heart. But he hasn't put it on my heart lately. Until yesterday, I saw it again. I'm thinking, gee, maybe we should do that again. And then, of course, all these things go through your mind. You know, is the money going to the right place? Is blah, 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 and all this stuff. But you know what? If God puts it on your heart, are you wheat or weeds? If God is telling you to do it, are you doing it? Are you willing to surrender 20 bucks a month for the life of some kid? Or are you just going to sit there and, you know, hoard what you have? And so these are the things that say to you whether you are wheat or weeds. Now, these are the experiences of life, and that's the experiences of life are what get us to develop hope. Hope is confidence. God wants Mike to have confidence that he's a Christian, Judy to have confidence that she's a Christian, Chris to have confidence, Matt to have confidence. How do you have confidence? By saying it? No. By experiencing God in your life. It's the only way. It's the way God develops hope in us, develops confidence and assurance in us, is by experiencing him in our lives. If you're not experiencing God in your life, the second parable says you can just start to surrender now. If you have a heart to surrender, you have a heart that's a realistic heart, not an egotistical, humanistic, or materialistic heart, but a, a heart that is a realistic heart that wants to be real with God. Surrender now. What's he saying to surrender now? I don't know. I don't know where you live. I don't know what you do necessarily you know, every part of your life. But I do know that there are ways to surrender to God now in your life. He puts your, he gives each of us a gift and he puts people in front of us to apply that gift. And if we are applying that gift, we will sense, we will experience, we will know God the whole, through his spirit, through his son in our lives to the point where there is no doubt that we have that confidence that we are Christians. We are wheat now, does that mean we should go around and look for weeds and pull up weeds? No. But what we could do is we could keep giving good information. We could keep doing the things that God has called us to do so people figure out themselves whether they're weed or weeds and have the opportunity to change. That's really what we're all about. That's what the church is. So we have these two parables that Jesus himself explained. And that's the good part. Jesus explained it. But now we come to the third parable, which he doesn't explain. So now we've got to come to an understanding of this parable. And here's the good thing. This is a good teaching. For teachers, this is probably one of the best places to teach in the Bible, of course. It teaches us how to use the Bible. 
See, one thing we do in this church, week after week after week after week after week after week after week, is we go over the Bible. And I try not to put too much of my thoughts into it, as much as I try to read it and then try to interpret it. But better than that, I try to interpret it according to what Scripture says Scripture is. In other words, Scripture is the best commentary on Scripture. It's not so simple to just take Scripture and apply it to truth. Often when you just take scripture and try to make a truth out of it, you are miscommunicating a truth. So God says, here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the rest of scripture to apply it with. To figure it out so that when you apply it, you are communicating truth. Now, here's the thing. This week, there was a miscommunication of truth in West Virginia. These people were standing there waiting for their loved ones to come out of this mine, and somebody came along and misunderstood a message. And they said, your loved ones are okay. Well, the people went berserk. They went crazy. They were praising God and thanking and, and having this great time and, and like celebrating that their loved ones were okay. And about an hour or so later, another message came and said that the first message was a misunderstanding, a miscommunication of truth. So what did these people do? They went berserk in the other direction. They said, oh, we hate this and we can't stand that and we, we're going to sue them and we're going to fight this and we're going to argue with that and why didn't they tell us? And if you are listening to or hearing or receiving or studying the Word of God yourself and you're not doing it the way you should be, you're not using Scripture to match with other Scripture, you're not using the symbols that Jesus gave us according to other symbols that Jesus gave you could be miscommunicating truth. And you know what? Here's the real thing. In West Virginia, it really didn't matter what they heard because what had happened had already happened. It really couldn't change what happened. And people were still angry at a miscommunication. Could you imagine what happens when we stand before God that we could have changed what happened, but we chose to believe a lie? We chose to have the wrong heart and look for a lie and put our faith in a lie? Could you imagine what's going to happen when we stand before the anger in our hearts, when we stand before God, the, the discouragement in our hearts, the stupidity? You ever hit your finger and go, you stupid? You know, I mean, I yell at myself more than I yell at anybody else. Imagine the, 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 the heart of the person who stands before God and God says, I never knew you. But God, didn't I do this? And do Sorry, I never knew you. And he says that. He says that in Matthew, that he never knows. He never knew some of us who think we are Christians. Now, Again, as a teacher, this is about communication. That's what a teacher tries to do. I don't have the specific answers for you, but I have the general scriptural uh, direction that we need to go in. And so we're going to take this parable apart a little bit, and we're going to try and learn not only what the parable means, but learn how to take it apart a little bit. I'll go, you know, I'll try and go slowly into it, but... Um, again, and I said, we were, Judy and I were talking, and, and there's a lot of information that comes out of these teachings. It's more informational than it is personal. But Jesus says this, and this is what you need to know, that if you have ears to hear, he is speaking this parable to you so that you will hear. So it's really a, not just about information, it's about are you willing to hear? Do you want to hear? Do you want to change? Do you want to grow? Do you want to be more wheat-like? Do you want to get into this process of growth. And again, that's what I do on Sundays. That's what we do week after week, is we sort of um, give information, give understanding, and then as a church, we have a place, hopefully, to apply that. We have an encouraging place where the Holy Spirit can move in your life and help you to apply it to each of us who need it. We're a good opportunity. This church is a good opportunity. Plenty of room. Church is a good opportunity to grow and a good opportunity to bring people who want to grow. So we have two parables that Jesus understands. The third parable is the parable of the mustard seed. It's chapter 13 of Matthew, verse 31. And it says this. He told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of, of garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air all come and perch in its branches. All right, now, let's look up here for a minute. We got, we got a, a, um, a bunch of symbols. We have actually 
six symbols, I would say, that we're going to look at here today. And I've heard a number of different teachings on this, and maybe some of you who've been studying the Bible have heard teachings on this. But I want to give you what I believe is the truth because, first of all, of course, I don't want to miscommunicate something, but I want to show you how Scripture backs up Scripture. And again, that's kind of what you need. If you really want to know the truth of what God is saying when he says what he says, so you stand before him and you say, thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth, rather than why didn't you tell me the truth? When he did and you just didn't want to hear it. We're going to see how that takes place today. There are six different mm, symbols. A mustard seed, a man, a field, a tree, um, the birds, and I threw in the branches too because they're part of the tree. So let's see what it says today. Again, Scripture doesn't use symbols in conflicting ways. I don't know if you know that. When a picture is given in a Bible, when God gives a picture, it's the same picture. The effects might be different depending on what soil the picture goes into. If, if your soil is a soil that doesn't want to hear what God has to say, if your heart is a heart that doesn't want to hear what God has to say, there will be a different effect from this particular symbol. But the symbol is the same. So, we'll start with the sower. Jesus himself tells us who the sower is. The sower is the Lord. The sower is him. The man himself is, the, is Jesus. So we know that Jesus is spreading seed. The seed is the word. But the seed takes different forms. The word takes different forms. The word could be hope. The word could be faith. And today we're going to see the mustard seed, which I believe is faith. In Matthew chapter, I wrote it down, chapter somewhere, chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, just like a mustard seed, you can move anything. You can move mountains. So Jesus himself likens the mustard seed to faith. So let's just go on what scripture says so far, because I think it's the only place mustard is used you know, in, in the New Testament. Well, let's just see. So he says, he says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Again, Jesus said the field, in back in the beginning of this chapter, the field is the world. So we have this mustard seed, this man who's throwing this mustard seed in the world. Now here's the other thing. It says the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The word in the Greek is basila. The basila, the, the, it really means dominion or it means more than kingdom. It means the influence or the power, the, um, the direction, the authority of God is like. And then it goes into negative stuff. See, this mustard seed, we're going to see, could be positive or negative. And we're going to see things about the tree, and we're going to see things about the birds. And This stuff could be positive or negative. Let's see what Scripture says. But I'll tell you something, there is some negative stuff here. So why is the kingdom of God like a negative thing? I, I kind of wrestled with that this week. Because you'd think the kingdom of God is perfect. But Jesus said back in the first parable, the kingdom of God is like the farmer who sows seed in this four soils. He goes over the soils that are negative, the soils that are against God, the egotistical soil, the humanistic soil, the, the um, materialistic heart or materialistic soil. He goes over that. So he, he goes over the opportunity to be good or the opportunity to be bad. Faith is the mustard seed. What if we have faith in the wrong stuff? We have a major problem. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about this mustard seed that could go the wrong way or could go the right way. Because if it goes the wrong way, you need, I need to know that it's going the wrong way. See, if faith, well, we'll talk, we, we just did Hebrews. Hebrews says that faith is the entrusting our lives to God, to something and then it goes on and explains, Hebrews explains God so that we entrust our lives in confidence to this awesome, loving, powerful, gracious God. But what if our faith is in something else? Well, he, the writer of Hebrews tells us, what if we put faith in angels? Or what if we put faith in Moses? Or what if we put faith in something? He says, there's no contest. It's foolish. It's vanity. It's going nowhere. Faith needs to be in God. So we're going to see what that means today with this mustard seed again. So we have this mustard seed. Now, what about mustard? What's mustard? Well, mustard, do you, ever, do you ever have a ham sandwich without mustard? It's not, 
too tasty. I mean, it's okay. It's kind of bland. Mustard is this spicy zing. And, and sometimes the more spicy the mustard, the better. You know, I mean, they sell spicy mustard. Somebody buys it. Somebody likes it. But mustard's more than that. Mustard is also, in those days, a healing agent. It's a mustard. They used mustard plasters to heal the chest, to heal the, you know, whatever was going on in the chest. And when something happens in scripture and it aims at the chest or it's for the chest, it's also a picture of the heart. So we have this mustard seed that's going to react to our heart. And it could react to a good heart or it could react to a bad heart. Okay, so that's what we've got. So we've got this kind of tasty zinger, which I believe is a picture of faith in the word. And as the word or the gospel goes out, it zings you. I mean, it does. You know, it says, it says that it's, it, it's supposed to do that. It stimulates you one way or another. You either hate it or you love it. If you don't, you're not listening. But if you actually listen, you hate it or you love it. And you could see in today's world, you could even see how um, the gospel angers people. I mean, their actions alone show you how angry they get at people who follow or worship God or, or preach the gospel. So we have this gospel going out to stimulate our blood, to stir up the world, to make, to give it, some, to give it some zing. And let's see, let's see what Jesus says about these other things. He says, he says so far. So he's the, he's the, um, he's the man who's sowing it. The field is the world. The mustard seed is, I believe, faith. He says, though it's the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. I titled this part egotism, egoism, ego, self. Did you know, I mean, Jesus even said it, that the mustard seed is like one of the smallest herb seeds that there could be. Okay, we all know that. And did you also know that a mustard is not just an herb, but it's an annual herb. It dies at the end of the year. Well, unfortunately, this mustard seed grew into a tree. It's not normal. It's abnormal for a, a shrub, a little annual. Do you ever grow an annual herb? Herb, it dies. It just dies. It can't grow very big. It's only got a year to grow. And that's what it does. Jesus says, it's the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. Again, if it grows into a tree, it demonstrates an unusual change in abnormal growth. What is the gospel supposed to do? The gospel is supposed to have you grow, but grow in the power of God. If you're growing in yourself, if you're growing in your ways of thinking, if you're applying the power of God or the word of God to your life, if you're doing it, if you don't want to listen to God, you know, the Bible says in the end times, people will come along and preach to itching ears. We don't use that term so much anymore, but an itching ear is one that wants to hear something, so it sort of maneuvers or, or it sort of makes what's being said fit what you want to hear, so you don't have to do so much. Or you don't have to do what God wants you to do, but you do what you want. That's called egotism. Do you have a heart that wants to be boss? Do you, or do you have a heart that wants to hear what God has to say? Because if you want to be boss, the mustard seed that's planted in you, the faith that's planted in you will grow into a tree. It's a tree of pride. Now if you go back to Daniel chapter 4, the whole, the whole chapter of Daniel chapter 4 is about Nebuchadnezzar. And he was a king, and he was probably the most powerful king in the world. Well, he was the most powerful king in the world at that time, but one of the most powerful kings that ever lived. And he was so prideful that he had this dream. And he interprets, and he asks Daniel to come and interpret this dream for him. And Daniel says, "Oh King, I wish that this wasn't you, but I need to tell you the tree is you." And he says, "God sees how prideful you are." And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, "God sees how prideful you are, and he's going to have to destroy that pride. So you're going to go crazy. You're going to do this, that, and the other thing." And so we have this picture of a tree. And again, I said, "Scripture interprets Scripture." Well, Jesus again is talking about a mustard seed that shouldn't grow into a tree, but it should stay a shrub. So what does it do as it grows into this tree? How does that happen? Egotism. A heart that's egotistical will be an abnormal growth of faith. You need to check your heart. You need to see, am I listening to God or am I trying to make God listen to me? He's God. 
I wouldn't want a God to listen to you or me. Would you? Now I would want a God that would allow me the privilege of praying to him that maybe in his heart of hearts, his loving heart, his gracious heart, he may show favor on me. He doesn't have to. He's proven that he did. What a father. Wow, he saved me. Didn't need to. I didn't deserve it. So I see his love. I see his heart. Can you pray to him? Of course you could pray to him. But you can't force him. You can't make him do anything. Contrary to a lot of popular thought. When you do, it's egotistical. It becomes a mustard tree. So we have the ego that pushes into pride. And um, again, we need to know that we think we know best, but God knows best. And so Luke says this, and uh, actually Jesus said this in Luke chapter 14, verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So what we have is we have a picture of this tree in the field that needs humility. What's your heart? Is your heart a humble heart? Is your faith in God or is your faith in you? Your faith needs to be, your mustard seed of faith needs to be in God. Before we pray, let me just say this. Before we pray, I just want to invite each of us to, as to where we are, and I don't care where we are. God doesn't even care where we are. What God cares is where we'll be. If he cared where we were, he'd never have saved us in the first place. But I want to invite each person who's listening to this and each person who's here to say this prayer today. It's an invitation for us to change. It's an invitation for us to be changed, to apply our faith, and to come into the family of God, or if we are in the family of God, to change into that place, that shrub, that mustard seed growth that comes from God rather than from us. So I'm going to pray this prayer. You could say these words after me. I'd like you to just say these words after me. And when you do, you will have committed to that change. Now it's God's job to do what needs to be done in us. So let's pray this prayer. Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done things wrong. But I want to stop doing them now. And I come to you this day, believing that you are my Lord.